Okay, that's the sound that means I'm going to call this meeting to order. <laughs> All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, welcome everyone to this almost summer night. Summer night weather we're having here. It's awesome. Great. Greg's got the windows open for those of you that are online that can't enjoy this. Enjoy this. Um, the first thing that we have on the agenda are homeowners associations. And I do, do not think there's anybody online or in the room from Fields of Long Grove or Highland Park. If you are, please speak up. I think I recognize Amy Gayton on the line. Um, I believe, yep. right? <laughs> yep. I recognize that number. <laughs> so you are not you are not one of the homeowners associations. <laughs> I am not. Maybe she is. Okay. Uh somebody else just joined us. And I'll just ask really quick too. Is um and uh, one more time, is anyone on from the fields of Long Grove or Highland Pines? If not, um, I'll keep us moving. It's time for public comment. I know we have at least one in the room. Chris Meyer, do you have Chris something? Chris Meyer, and from Vernon Hills. And uh, I understand from Greg that he left a message, but I volunteered at the hospital this afternoon, went out to dinner, and I haven't been home. So I apologize for not listening. I did go to the Vernon Hills Village meeting, and they said because the property isn't within the purview of Long Grove. It's up to Long Grove to pursue. It, you meaning uh, it's not in the uh, purview of Vernon Hills? In the purview of Long Grove, yes. yes. And one thing I did want to add was that uh, my next door neighbor was going to come, but something came up at the last minute. His wife got ill. And uh, part of his friends is already down. And the neighbor on the to my right, which would be the west. She's in her 90s. Um, the buckthorn that has invaded her yard is unbelievable from this farm. I mean, it, it changed the watershed. Um, it, and it's just a mess. And I'm up to here. I just had it. As I told the village of Vernon Hill, I could put up a fence. It, being on a fixed pension and social security, which hopefully we'll get the next month. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, it would be a, an expense for me, but uh, I could do it, but then I'd have to put it just inside their fence and it would continue to fall into mine and damage my new fence. So there's no point to it. And it's just, it's just become an abominable and I, I was explaining to President Jacob because he asked earlier, in the, or last week and then earlier this week where we were at on it, and I said just not getting them to call back, not, not getting any response from the farms themselves. I reached out to Government Affairs over at Abbott's corporate office. Um, don't know, that was today, so I don't know if I'll hear something back. Perhaps I will. But I'll work with uh, Mr. Pickrell and Mr. Filippini and looking at next approach on the communication. I've been told that it's not always easy to get contact with them in the past. At least that's what I've been informed. So yeah, but Vernon Hills gets no response. <clears throat> so yeah. we're. I mean, I, I I could sue I could sue them, but then it would cost more than what it would cost them to put up a plan. Let let let's let let us continue to to attack it and see what we can come up with, Chris. And then and then uh, I work I work with our council and our staff and. Yeah, and if you keep me informed. Absolutely. I, my I'm, neighbor next door, as I said, wasn't able to come. Um, but part of his is down, but he doesn't have dogs, and nor does he have small children. And if I need to get a petition of everybody all the way around, I, I'd be happy to do it. <laughs> I mean, there are lots of homes, and it's, it's just yeah, but. Let's see. No, you're. Yeah, I fully understand it. I've been out to your place and I've looked out there and I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> so uh, let us continue to hit it, and I'll keep you informed. I get your number. Okay. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Is there anybody at that facility on the Facebook besides the guards? Um, 
Yeah, every now and then, I was going to say, you see two or three people out there, and you'll see them go into the various uh, agricultural houses. I don't know if they're stocking livestock or not in there, but, uh, yeah. And but, I think Weisner still, I think Weisner still farms it. I don't believe Weisner farms it anymore. He, he uh, retired a year or two ago. Oh, okay. Him. So that's why it's not being, even being mowed. At least he mowed the top, but right now, the grass has got to be this high. Yeah, and in, in doing some searching, it's Abbott's people who, who are farming that farming that land. Oh, okay. So, well, Kent lives nearby there, so he knows that yeah, place I'm well. Very familiar with that area. <laughs> and how mysterious it is. Where do you live? I live in Oakwood Street. Region. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're familiar with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are there any other public comment um, online or in the room? Thank you for bringing that forward. Um, I'll, there's nobody from the uh, sheriff department or fire department districts here tonight, correct? Um, so then that brings us, and there was no public comment received, written public comment, right? Okay. And you know, realize that we didn't do a roll call, but we don't have to do a roll call anymore. I know it's just strange, right? Get into the habit of a bit. What'd you say? The beginning of the meeting, which should have been done, right? No, no. Not necessary? No, it's not We're necessary. COVID. COVID rules are done. Well, not necessary. So. <laughs> but don't Robert's rules require? No, no. no. <laughs> yep, nope. Call it failure. We've never had to take attendance in the past, so in, except for when COVID. COVID. Um, all right, let's keep keep us moving. Now we have a consent agenda. There's three items on it. Consideration approval of the 2023, April 2023 Treasurer's Report. Uh, consideration approval of the meeting minutes from the May 9th, 2023 meeting. There were, there's a new version of the minutes that circulated. Yeah. And I don't know if anyone has any questions on those. And then there's the one-year water extension contract, which is uh, in the board packet and then detailed in the bill report. Any questions? The treasurer's report in the finance folder. Um, if you go into uh, depart, uh, department reports, finance. Uh, I happen to have a paper copy of it if you want to look at oh, it. I got it here. That's okay. okay. That's it. I have a question about the, the letter. Mm -hmm. not, not the waiver, just a, a question. My memory when we started this was the fee, annual fee was based upon the fact that Gaywell Hamilton basically had to hire employees to do the job. It wasn't someone on staff, they had to be somebody with a water license and they were bringing, bringing a, a fellow in to do it. And now it seems it's because the, the, the is it because the class of license has changed that we don't need that special background or special license to? We didn't have that at that time. We do now. So that's why it's not there. It's the same license requirement um, in 2019 as it is now for Class B water operator license that we need. Yeah. Is my memory correct or is it faulty on the, the, the way we? Yeah, in 2019, that was a, a discussion point. Correct. Yeah. You're, you're right. Okay. And that has nothing to do with this because we're just renewing for a year. For a year. Well, that person is no longer going to be. No, actually, he's still the operator. He is. He's the responsible operator in charge. Yep. I think. We went from a C operator to a B operator, and then with that B operator, they were. Not not yet. We still are at a B, but if we get the Lake Michigan water. No, no, I, we went from we went from a C to a B, didn't we? Or we always, always, always had a B. And and then the operator, uh, the fifteen hundred is the increase on the expense for the operator. But you're no longer on the team. Myself off. <laughs> <laughs> so going under any other questions, or somebody want to no, make a motion to approve? I move by Trustee O'Connor, second by Trustee Tanucci, and we'll just go ahead and take a roll call. Trustee O'Connor. Uh, yes, Trustee Tanucci. Aye. Trustee Browski. Aye. Trustee Jamil. Uh, 
Okay, was that a uh, yes? Oh, okay, but oh, but did you answer yes to the to the vote? Okay, good. Just making sure. Sorry. Good. Just checking. Just check. Okay. So motion carried. Thank you. Because a stain is a yes vote, so uh, good. Right. Goes to the majority. All right. So uh, moving right along to the village planner's report, which will be given. Uh, by Village Manager Jackson. The uh, planner's reports in the package. The Architectural Commission met on May 15th, uh, heard uh, 340 Old McHenry Road, Brothers Field. Brother, they are here this evening to talk about a different concept that they want to present to the board. They have a recommendation to go to PTZBA, so they have not gone back to the Architectural Commission. Olson Storage was heard by the Architectural Commission. Uh, from what I am told by the planner, uh, information they received from the Architectural Commission was well received. They're going back to adjust some plans and then they'll be coming back before the 18 again um, as far as appearance goes. 350 Old McHenry Road is a siding replacement. Um, a proposal to change the siding from, from sing Peter Shingles to Horizontal Vital was considered. Uh, the uh, AC asked them to come back and they uh, to get a better look at the materials. Also some work on the staircase. Uh, 3305, the Planning Commission heard 3305 Old McHenry Road. It's a garage, garage setback variation. Uh, they've been, they continued that until the June meeting, so um, Rose will be coming back before the PZZBA. Uh, Joni's Pizza, the request for a special use permit for outdoor dining. In talking to the owners of the properties, they are putting together a uh, landscaping plan, which they believe will help serve to mitigate some of the concerns about noise, and they are presenting that to the PZZBA. And then Phillips Estates, all the plans are in. We're looking to move forward with the final PUD on that. Any questions? All right, we'll keep us moving. Uh, Village Engineers report presented by Jeff Perry. All right. Road maintenance program. This is uh, driver park at Coffin Road, uh, uh, Creekside, Geibel Court, uh, Arrowhead, and then the alternates with Archer and Three Lakes. And it's also got the intersection of Long Grove Road and Fifth Street, languishing a little bit with I dot, so kind of rattled some cages there last week, and hopefully we get there next week so that we can get the thing out to it. So just want to give the board the update on that. Number four, the checker road traffic calming, uh, as we discussed a few months ago, we were uh, promised some data from Buffalo Grove uh, as part of their phase one study for the intersection part of the night. And they cook, they actually studied uh, you know, the number of vehicles that were using Schaefer and Checker's cut through. They promised us that February, then they said spring, and now they said summer. So it's uh, lacking in language. So not sure what the the uh, the deal is and why, but uh, we'll keep asking for it and keep uh, keep on it. Is there another way we can? Ask? Um, are you are you giving me feedback? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll uh, see if I'll see if Greg can yes, maybe uh, you know anything that way. We're still waiting so, for information. Okay. Um, okay. Primarily, they're we've gone right with their consultants. They're uh, using civil tech for that. But um, yeah. so perhaps that's a. Projects. First, uh, number nine, the Arlington Heights Road reconstruction. Uh, has uh, a lot of discussion with the DOT and Julian Rostowski over there. Uh, they're looking to bid that project in September. 
likely to start that in April 2024, again, an 18-month project. Uh, just a couple notes here from recent conversations with center medians. Uh, there's some landscapes there. Uh, they don't want to put the trees back there, you know, sight lines and things like that. Um, we're going to, you know, pretty high need grasses, uh, and Buffalo Grove is under uh, IGA to maintain that. Um, we did learn that there's pedestrian accommodations, crosswalks with uh, push down timers at all four um, legs of the intersection at Arlington Heights and 83. So that'll be a welcome addition. And uh, the county DOT provided us <coughs> plans, but um, they need some uh, direction from the village and uh, in input on whether it's the left turn lane on Checker to northbound Arlington Heights Road, uh, if the village would like that striped, or if they would like the left turn lane striped, striped, striped out, I should say, you know, uh, like a diagonal hatch, hatch striped. Um, talking with Lake County DOT, the intersection needs to be widened to, mm -hmm. you know, three lanes, meaning, you know, one lane to come in to checker to go westbound. That center lane will be there, whether it's striped out with a crosshatch or striped as a turn lane is up to uh, village decision and direction. And LC that was pretty yeah. pretty clear to when we had this meeting with them that uh, it matters to them either way, whatever, whatever, way, whatever way the village wants to go. Can we encourage turning on the checker when we have so much trouble on checker? Yeah, so the, so the road and people use it. Well, so the question is, um, if you didn't put the left turn lane there and you striped it, is it a safety hazard, right? And that's the question that I asked. So, because um, they don't care that we can, you know, have it not designated as a left turn lane, but cars will probably drive into it anyways and use it as such. And so is it a safety hazard? And that's what we asked uh, Jeff and Greg to look, you know, get some information on. You know, and, or unless the board says, hey, I absolutely make sure that the, the left turn lane's there, but it'll, it'll make it easier for cut through traffic then. So. Well, but I mean, one thing to sit there, but waiting to turn, Legally or illegally, it's not ready to get across. Mm -hmm. So, what are they doing now? <coughs> there's only one lane. There's only one. There's only. It's only one lane. One lane each way. So they're going to make it. It'll be two lanes up there. So they're going to block one of the lanes off. It's kind of like one and a half lanes. Because if you're turning left, you got cars sneaking around yep. you. Yeah. Right. yeah. And the oncoming is the same direction. It's a good place to get nailed because there's no. Order to the oncoming traffic heading west. Doctor Jamal, you know where this is, right? This is uh, Checker Road at Arlington Heights Road. I just want to make sure. So, yeah. And is that where they're putting the pedestrian, one of the pedestrian yes. crossways? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, what what's the safety factor for them? with cars turning left? Yeah. Good point. I mean, so I've, that's four lanes, and everybody goes as fast as they can. Yep. Go ahead. No. It's part of the project. No cost. Right. Uh, regardless of which way it is, and that's uh, the cost to the county. Because they have an obligation to widen the three lanes to match the east side of the road. So, Jeff, is there any repair or improvement to the intersection of 53 and Arlington Heights Road? Are we doing anything differently or just traffic wise? I mean, is there any significant improvement to route traffic through there or quickly? 83? I'm sorry, um, Arlington Heights Road and Lake Cook. And Lake Cook. Um, mm -hmm. It's not part of this this project, so that's the phase one study that I was referring to that Buffalo Grove is working with uh, the Cook County DOT on. The one thing that is part of the county's project is they're extending the left or the right turn lane. Um, Southbound Arlington Heights to go westbound on uh, Lake Cook. Oh, understood. Thank you. All right, so we're, we're waiting we're, for more information. We're, we're yeah. uh, getting some more information from the county, and I think the other question I've got to them is, uh, you know, if that thing is striped and blocked out, as don't use it as a left turn lane, 
what implication does that have on the signal? Because I would imagine if there's a left turn lane, it will have a left green arrow. This is out what does that do to the signal timing? So we'll get a little bit more information, bring it back and forth. Let's see the question. Would they put a on that? No, they don't. Don't. Give me the eyebrows. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll do what? it. Did that turn in with a quick pedestrian overpass in there? <laughs> You're going to have cars turning left on four or five lane roads. What, what family, what child is going to use on their little bike hitting that button? What do they have? What chance do they have? And there are no sidewalks on checker. It's the, the crossing north south. Yeah, there's right. some accommodations in the red line checkered, correct? Anybody discuss that? The opportunity for that was a public input. I don't know if anybody brought that up. Anyway, the other project that the county is doing is the Advocates Road Widening Project. Uh, still negotiating and getting the contract for Lake County Green approved through the county process. Um, Senator Jackson and I were still uh, working with Lake County DOT to see if they will have any sort of meeting with uh, the residents, you know, Friday Woods, Friday Briarcrest, and Eastgate. They said yes, and they, and they said, said no. no. So. If we can find some uh, some middle ground here, uh, because uh, well, we, we don't want to just rely on the postcard system that they typically use on their projects. Kind of another a touch point, just to let everybody know that the project is happening. It's going to be disruptive. You know, if you want to call, here you go. Here's contact information. Oh, my robot. My robot. So, yeah. so we're still uh, working through that. Um, also, I'm sorry. Uh, also on the I provided the uh, board with some information related to the uh, water connection that we'd want to do concurrently with the work being done on Epikissick Road for the connection to the fire department when they locate the new firehouse. Uh, I have a uh, coming off of what some uh, Trustee Borowski said at the last meeting. I've reached out to the fire department to ask them for a memo of understanding and uh, recovering the cost associated with that. And uh, they, uh, they have agreed uh, to start working on that. And then their attorney is going to get in touch with our village attorney to navigate the recapture agreement for um, people hooking into that portion of the water. Vic is already aware of it. We've had some discussions on it. So we're moving that forward as well. Wasn't, wasn't the discussion at the last meeting about putting a sleeve in there? Right. Um, and that's what this casing pipe is called. Um, Bold point number two, the, the uh, require that. Energy. Now, the uh, purpose of this memo is just kind of get it on paper, oh, just uh, memo. a little bit of the route that the water main needs to take it to connect to Sunset Road, you know, along the south side of Atticistic and then cross over to 159. Um, so the cost, and it was in the, in the budget, uh, 350000 for the construction work. Uh, we did add the soft costs in there just to get an all-in number on this. And you uh, recommended a 15% contingency? Yeah. So I traded some emails with uh, Manager Jackson this morning, the 350, you know, I would put a construction contingency on it. And right as soon as I said that, I had some bid results for another project back that uh, were not as bad as I thought. Like I said, pr construction prices this year, every day they seem to change. So. Some days are, are, are up, some days are down. Today was a, today was a good day for uh, pave, for paving work. Why, why does it go so far east instead of straight across? Or so this is the, the schematic plan. Um, once we get a little bit more information from Chief Sagawa, uh, we can dial that in. So the idea is to run it right to the firehouse as opposed to, I guess I don't even know where the firehouse is when you're around here. So. It, it's going, if you were to look at Aptekissick on the north side coming uh, west, I'm sorry, east on, uh, on Aptekissick, there is the, are those two frame houses that are right there on the north just kind of okay, so it's diagonal from the uh, uh, retention pond. Okay, so it's going right to that property. Mm -hmm. I see. I'm sorry? 
greenhouse or something? Well, color of a house, right? The, the, the frame houses, the frame houses. Oh, okay. Yeah. Said oh, no, frame houses. So, and, and with this, you know, when we get fleshed out, um, the, the detailed design that, you know, we look at, um, you know, putting stuff in there, you know, for, you know, extension use if that happens um, on either side of Atkinson Road, just the options for that so that you don't have to take apart what you just put together. Okay. Um, so, so we're waiting for additional information on Chief Scott from uh, the fire department on that, but just a memo just to kind of kind of put uh, a little bit of a uh, picture of a thousand words on things. Um, my fellow board members, do we have any um, interest in getting Buffalo Grove's voice to join with ours? If, if, if it's my voice, then to see if they would consider a pedestrian home set as part of the road. Is there any traffic study on pedestrians and like how many people go through there actually? How many would be? Right, understood. Do we have any maybe, idea? Maybe like, we get the traffic numbers at the same time. Um, yeah, probably from the count from Lake County. I know they did traffic studies. You know, they did that uh, turn at Fremont Way. Um, I could ask them what right. other data they get further south. I um, don't know if it has pedestrians in it or not. But but they're, it they're creating a pedestrian walkway. Mm -hmm. They're attracting children, adults, yep. people on you know, the streets looking at their cell phones. Good. Sorry, were you talking about Diamond Lake Road? Or? <laughs> uh, I may have misheard. Oh, geez. Um, There's no turn on that. Uh, I'll just, no, you don't need one. Because it's pretty good right now. Kent or uh, uh, Trustee Jamil, any? any? I would support a left turn right now. And I don't think there's enough pedestrians to justify an overcome. Yeah. Those are my comments. Yeah, I don't know how we know that. It'd be great to have that data. You know, who do we, and it's the same with the sidewalk on Arlington Heights Road. I mean, People are going to use it. I, I don't know. But why are they putting those in? Because uh, they can. Why are we putting it in? Because we can. We got money. We got a great deal from the <coughs> county. I mean, but we don't have a count of how many people actually even use that sidewalk. Good. Not well, <laughs> I don't have an estimate. I don't even know how many people live in that subdivision that would possibly even think about it based on statistical averages of kids on bikes. I, I have no idea. About 22 widening, switching to Illinois DOT, get, uh, get some uh, files from them so we can update the uh, landscape enhancement plan and re engage those discussions. So that will be coming forward in the third and two. Then, uh, Manager Jackson, you might be able to explain this a little bit, but under uh, number 17. Unauthorized work, uh, construction work going on over at the Grove Country Club. This village uh, line red tagged them last week on or the week before. Pickleball course, they were doing something with the bridge. I still don't have it. Yeah, we, yeah, we received a call from a nearby resident. Uh, I went out there with Mundelein. Sure enough, they were doing it. They we read we red tagged it. I then went in and met with the uh, club manager and said. Can't do the work until you file permits. Some work on a bridge as well. Some concerns on what was actually being done. If it was plank repair, they were actually doing some uh, much more intensive uh, structural repairs. I reached out for their attorney that we've been dealing with in the past, uh, Pat Greco, and asked him to get in touch with me. He did. He apologized. He told them not to continue to do the work. Most recent checks out there, they, they have not continued to do the work. Um, he and I are supposed are supposed to have a conversation tomorrow on next steps. He was trying to get a survey so he could turn around and do it the proper way. 
So right now they're red tagged on the project. Hmm? One of the bridges oh, over a bridge or something over a creek. One of the holes. Yeah. Oh. Yep. And if, if I can go back for a second, just an FYI, the village, village hall expansion, uh, the planning committee is meeting on June 5th at 330 on that. So. Our case is uh, moving forward with uh, organizing the native area landscape maintenance and then uh, the urban forest management also provides them a current list of trees that need to be replaced over there. So um, they've been responsible for communication, so that's a good sign. Um, they're waiting for schedule from tall graphs, if I understand correctly, for a uh, landscape burn. So this is the first thing that they do. It's a bit late in the season for yeah, that. Yeah, kind of late for that. Um, and they're all Burnham. behind. You know, weather just broke here a couple of weeks ago, so. But I mean, everything is very green. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, see if they can still do something. Um, a burn, maybe not. You know, maybe some selective or something like that. I think we mentioned in April that it would be a good time. Yeah, and we've, uh, we've reminded the film of that um, at least twice a month ever since uh, February. So. I think I have mine. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Manager Jackson stole my thunder, but uh, Phil at the States, we did receive the advisory on that um, after a couple of years, so those are under review so we can get that uh, in control. So does that mean they give us an extra lot where the lift station was going to be? They're at 19. Right. No, that didn't change. I don't. I think. It's I'd have to go. How do you do that? That's amazing. What? How do you remember that? That's um, well, if I recall, that she was pretty involved in that one, that little negotiation. <laughs> if I recall correctly. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Um, You're smiling at me. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in the report, unless there's any uh, questions. All right. Thank you, uh, Village Engineer Perry. Uh, <clears throat> the next item is uh, discussion and consideration approval and ordinance amending section 3.2.5 R of the Long Grove Village Code regarding temporary special liquor licenses. Um, this is in regards to Brother Sealfield, who is here tonight. Um, when we approved the resolution um, to allow them to continue to operate uh, this year, it was only to operate with um, to sell alcohol with a uh, special event. It was not to allow them to sell alcohol outside of a special event. And so um, you have before you a, a decision to make um, tonight as to, or discussion we can discuss as to if um, you want to allow Brothers Field to operate um, as a, I guess, a bar uh, when there's not a special event. It would only be on three days a week. It would be uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, right? Correct. So that's what's before you right now. Um, and uh, I guess uh, any discussion first on this? Any comments? I understand why we have to keep going over this. The, the uh, violation of the liquor code was noted because Brothers Field was serving on days that they were not permitted by the ordinance to do. Uh, when I approached Brothers Field, they uh, simply said they didn't realize that. They thought that the permit, I'm sorry, the liquor license was for uh, the similar business that they were operating uh, during COVID, where it was special events, and then on the days it wasn't special events, they were open to do business. Brought that back. Uh, they then asked that we would take a look, and they made a request to the board to amend it. Um, for operations Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, whether it had a special event or not, staying within the same hours that uh, were required. I then engaged the village attorney. That's what's presented in here with the special event. T and T1, I think, is what uh, they have here. But the, 
board has the option of, of uh, and, and the village attorney can jump in any time he wants, but the board has the option of going ahead and just letting the existing liquor license stand or um, allow for the creation, it's what this ordinance would do, uh, creation of a second, second liquor license for special events, which would allow the operation without, with or without a special event taking place on those days at those hours that were previously um, required. There's also an additional uh, cost with this SET2 license. And that's exactly right. So, I mean, these are these are licenses are identical, except that the second tier of SC license just simply doesn't require a special event permit mm -hmm. to accompany it. So it's it's up to the village board whether discretion whether this is something you want to allow. At the fee structure for special occasions, fee structure is more than the normal license fees. Why is that? Uh, I think the, uh, the fee structure is typically associated with the administration involved in the amount of liquor being sold. And here, presumably, since the first one is tethered only to special events, and this one allows you to sell any Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, regardless of the special event, that it, uh, the fee is correspondingly higher. The board, the board also needs to know that this will be taking this will be going into a different direction with this business, in the sense of. In a different direction, in the sense post-pandemic. Okay, pandemic, there was a lot of uh, uh, latitude given to allow the operation, but post-pandemic now, where we're getting everybody back into the swing of being in compliance with accessory structures and everything else, uh, this ends up uh, being an outside uh, drinking venue, is is what it does, and there, there's no other way to describe that. Uh, special events will still take place as they had scheduled um, early in the season. That that doesn't go away. Those special event applications have been submitted and they're being processed in some fact somewhere before the board this, this evening. But collateral to that business, they are asking to operate um, an establishment, in, 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 an outside bar. So refresh my memory. The reason why we have this special license as opposed, to, as opposed to licenses in other businesses, is because it's outdoors in a temporary type setup. Because because how they operate and what they operate does not fall within the PUD, and there's nothing in our code that permits them to do that. Yeah, and let's specific location. Yeah, and let's step back a second too, because um, so um, Brothers Field got a liquor license for the dance studio, thinking that they would serve alcohol there, et cetera, and do some special events. And then when uh, COVID hit. Uh, they decided to apply for special events outdoor, kind of an experiment, um, and that sort of morphed into a variety of things, right, over the years. And what I have said to Greg when he became village manager, and I still want to make this happen, was as we exit COVID, how do we take the business that Brothers Fields has and fit it into our code and make it so that they can operate? And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. And we're not we're not there yet, and there's some other items on the agenda that are relative to this conversation. But the the thing before us tonight is, you know, we already gave approval to operate, um, you know, special events the way they have in the past. But what we didn't do when we made that approval is we didn't allow them to operate a bar when there's not a special event, right? Mm -hmm. It's the only time they can serve alcohol if, if there's a special event, approved special event application. And the goal is for this to be a transition year, and by next season we would have something permanent in place. Well, I sure hope so, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, as, as a point of information, these licenses, both the business and the liquor license, expire at uh, October 23. So it's it'd have to be reintroduced as a whole new license if that was going to happen again. Then there's another element to this whole thing, which is interesting too, and that is is that all of the restaurant venues in town, I mean, all the businesses in town, except for the brewery, they serve food as a part of their liquor license. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a bar license per se. Yeah. The, um, the brewery uh, obviously has a, has a uh, tasting room, right? Um, and uh, so that, that was part of that, that operation that went in. And it's a unique setup. The other, all the other places are serve an element of food as a part of the so that's the other challenge we have. 
this yeah. amendment to the already existing ordinance? Is that the correct understanding? It's, it is a amendment to, to the village code as it pertains to liquor licenses, creating both the SET uh, and the SET2 before there was just an SET. So it's, it's in a total amendment creating two liquor licenses. Two types of liquor licenses. And, and, we, and so we don't, I don't know if it was in the board packet, but there are there's a whole list of liquor licenses. And so um, we've had to be creative as we've gone along and to try to adapt to the needs of what businesses want to do. So this is, this is really carving out uh, a unique, two unique liquor licenses. Does it make sense for us to talk? I'm sorry, Reed. Go ahead. I, I was just going to ask, does it make sense to talk about the revised plans at this point, or, or is it not pertinent? That, I mean, that's right. I, this is a separate issue from that. I think we should defer that conversation to a lot of So, I again, my recollection okay. is when we discussed this, I think it's a last board meeting or second last board meeting. It was the vote that we took was because the an outdoor bar doesn't fit the way we would like it to. And that was an alternative to using the studio. And now there's no more COVID, so why not? Why not use the studio, number one? Number two, we specifically voted on this in the way that we did, whether whether it was understood or not, that was the discussion we had that you know, this this kind of we're trying to we're trying to make everything look nice and be nice and, and inviting. And I think I think the special events are very creative and I, I think they're a lot of people enjoy it for that. I, I thought that we said, you know, now is the time. So the, uh, is, is that correct? I would I would add I would add this or answer one of the questions you asked. It can't go back to it does, wouldn't go back to the uh, dance studio. The dance studio had a P license, which no longer is ex exists in the code. When when we made the last amendments before this one to the village code, we, we got rid of the P license. And it is a separate business. Metro North is uh, has the Fred Astaire studio, separate business. This is an entire different business license. And it was um, by design that uh, Brothers Field did that. They wanted to separate the two businesses. So that, that that's where that separation goes. The, the uh, discussion that the board had about the special events and limiting uh, the activity, um, th that was certainly something that was had. Now, it, the board, the, everybody had in their board package the, uh, the uh, amendment to the, to the code, and it clearly stated that it was going to be for special events. Right. Well, so again, I, I don't know. I don't understand why why it's being reconsidered. I, I I get that this, you know we're creating we would create a different kind of license to do it. We we already we we've, we've got two trustees absent. You know, we already talked about it. We've got uh, the, the as as I brought yeah. it, as I brought to the board. Right now, they are operating in violation of the liquor code. Um, so if they if they if, if a decision is made tonight that uh, the SDT2 uh, is not where the board wants to go, um, the only way they can operate then is because they do have their license for special events is to continue that with special events. Um, but there's no other way to say it. I sat with the guys and I turned around and I said, you guys are operating outside the village ordinance. You guys are I, I told them point blank. Their response was, how do we get it changed? Trustee Jamila, you had a comment, right? I have a quick question. Uh, if any a new business coming in, applying for the license, so it's a special event license club together with the, uh, the original license fee, or there is only one special event uh, for any new businesses, they have to apply under this ordinance. Each, the, the village code only allows licenses to be, there's not like a special event license and there's 20 of them out there, there's one. And that, that one is 
right now for uh, Brothers Field. So nobody else, somebody could come in and ask the village board to increase the number of special event licenses based on the business model that they bring forward. But right now, there's only one license. So on the days that you don't have special events, what do you offer besides teaching them? What activities are there? Um, so basically, uh, outdoor seating, relaxation. You know, people come out and have kind of a Jimmy Buffett vibe with the music, if you will. Some people bring the lawn chairs and we've got big games that people play and they bring their kids and just kind of sit and enjoy the day in the community. Kind of think about it like a, like a backyard barbecue with the entire house. Um, and if I, I could just kind of, could I read, I, I share some of your um, confusion with it. Um, you know, somehow we, we maybe missed it or whatever, but, but the idea of operating 16 days this year, that's, that was never the intention of us. What we understood with bringing the transitional licenses. We knew we were coming out of COVID and we appreciate all the efforts that, to help us get out of that and, and get moving. The later part of this meeting is the, the building and the brick and mortar to try and make this work for everybody permanently. But this season, our understanding was always a transitional season to allow us to continue what we we're doing. You know, this is not the first season, this is not the second season, this is the third season. What we're asking for as far as the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, was what we always what we had with the original license. So we're not trying to add to that. We were we were surprised to find out that our entire business plan was planned around 16 days a year. That that financially makes no sense. No sense. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday was what we had done the previous two years. The transitional license was to allow us to do that for six more months to make it through this year, help increase our capital and put us in a position now to put in order for 2024. And we were surprised to find out we had only been granted 16 days. I don't know how that slid in and went in the radar. I'm not saying it was nefarious in any way, but that was never the meeting. I, and that's what I mean. It, it somehow, somehow it went from us going, yep, we want to keep doing what we were doing, which was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We never said we want to kind of do what we keep doing and take more than a two thirds of that. So that's where it was. It was a surprise. Were we at the meeting? Yes. And that's what I said. Maybe we must have missed them, but never was it disclosed as like, we weren't going to keep doing what we were doing. My understanding was we were going to get six more months to do what was a proven model, to do what has helped this town, helped this business, and helped this community. And I think you guys know that that it's had to be part of that. We needed six more months of that to put us in our position for next year to get this into a brick and mortar and a situation where everybody can move forward on a permanent basis. They're, they're and that's why we're here because. We were, we were honestly a little flabbergasted to find out we were expected to operate. There, there, there needs to be something for the record, though, is, is, is it that the uh, um, how Brothers Field was op how Metro North was operating under the P license is it was not how they were operating was not necessarily permitted on how the P license was. P license was supposed to be for the um, dance studio. They were latitude was afforded because of COVID. I just want to make sure that somebody doesn't say we issued a P license that let this all go out. That's, that's not absolutely true. To, to right to your point, when COVID hit, all of us downtown, and, and to much credit, this time allowed us to pivot in ways that we've never seen in the business community. And guess what? It worked. We saw more growth in the downtown business in the three years of COVID than we did in the decade before that. What we are doing is bringing bodies to town. Bodies to town will bring restaurants to town. Restaurants to town will help fill these retail. You're not going to get these retail filled without bodies to town. And that's what we brought. We brought them by the town. And we'll continue to do um, Hey, uh, I just want to ask uh, Trustee Borowski if you have any comments. If you don't, I have a question. Why don't you ask? Okay, well. I'm not at all a supporter of a bar, outdoor bar. Just not been okay. consistent in that messaging. I'm not a supporter. I understand your guys' request here, and I get it. Um, it. It's kind of a, it's kind of a tough, tough decision for me actually. But I understand what you guys are asking for. I mean, from a business perspective, I get it. But don't see Long Road being an outdoor bar kind of town. It's not why we moved here. And, and I agree, I, I would challenge anyone who spends any amount of time there to call it an outdoor bar. 
That is such a minor, minor part of what we do. Is in a couple of hours, at, when the sun goes down, where the first bar closes in town, we're done at 11, everybody goes to Chatterbox, goes to the brewery, goes to the Tavern Jones. We are not an outdoor park. We are an outdoor community space that happens to sell beverages to afford to provide that space. Alcohol sales are what provides two acres of green space for hundreds of people in the local community to come to. Without the alcohol sales, there is no green space. That's what we thought. So I understand it, but I, I just, if you haven't been there and spent the day watching the grandparents with the grandkids and everybody running around having a good time with the dogs, do me a favor, don't call it a bar if you haven't been there. That's it. So that's what we do. And you haven't been there either? Yeah. I was there last summer. Let me ask a, me ask a question. So, um, one of the challenges we have is every decision we make can be precedent setting. So the question is, um, if we, you know, allow Brothers Field to operate the same way they've operated in the past, um, you know, post COVID, are we setting a precedent or do we have coverage because of the fact that this is still a temporary situation and we're in a transition here? Well, these, uh, these, whatever the village board does, this will, this per this uh, uh, otherwise it terminates in October. So there is a temporary nature, no matter what is done here. Okay. Um, in terms of what is done generally, I mean, there was a lot of accommodations on uh, reported to various businesses during COVID, and then there was flexibility granted. And if that flexibility can establish a precedent of you know, well, we just will either you know, COVID has ended, and either the business conformed to the absence of a pandemic, or we conform the village code to the habits that were developed during and that's that's what the village wants to do is that's the policy decision and that's um should be clear about what what the goal is there if that's if you want to which which way the conformity will go and um so and, and if we said you know there is a uh, perhaps not not a legal president but a president uh, in terms of expectations if you're going to conform the village code to have this developed during the pandemic uh that may um other people may have that same expectation so, so let me just follow up on that. So, because uh, uh, again, as I always said to Greg when he became our village manager, we're trying to figure out how do we bring Brothers Field, how do we how do we fit this into our village to make it work with our codes, right? So, um, in this additional year, um, if they did this and we allowed this, does that mean, um, and it's and it's and it's let's say it's over after this year, right? Because there's going to be a new business, hopefully it'll serve food, um, and then we can get through this whole issue. Um, by just granting it till uh, October or whatever it is, to, does that open us up for somebody else to come in and say, I want to do this exact same thing temporarily or next year? Uh, I mean, well, it expires at the end of October. Right. No, so but, but just because have, we did it now, we don't have and we don't have the cover of COVID anymore yeah. and the governor's uh, disaster declaration, do we, right. are we in a we, bad spot? Are there the people at the, the, the village can establish liquor licenses that it desires as long as they're rational given the circumstances and that they, they can't come in and say because you granted relief a i'm entitled to relief b that's they cannot do that however they will i would say you probably would face more requests of that nature um but from a legal perspective you will not be required to give that relief it's something that is again up for the uh, is, is to be rational and based on uh, the normal principles of of assigning liquor licenses is it in the village's best interest? So they've been operating, so now this is the third year. We have a view towards something permanent next year. I think pulling the rug out from under them at this point is not really fair to them. Um, let them complete their third year, but then this is it. Next year, something needs to be permanent. Let them continue what they're doing for the third and final year. By next year, we'll have something permanent, and we'll move forward from there. I don't think it's fair to them to pull the rug out at this point. Yes, there are two points that I agree with him. Uh, the other businesses can come in. I don't know uh, if that will be a decision for everybody to kind of apply for a temporary license. So for this year, I think I agree with Kent. Go forward, whatever the 
still put in some place uh, some uh, separate document and apply it on temporary licenses. And I did go there either last year or the year before, and I agree, it's, it's a family environment. Yes, they serve alcohol, but it's not a quote bar environment, it's more of a family environment. I don't have a problem with it being, I don't, I don't really care what you call it. I, I don't care if it's a bar, I don't care if it's a tavern, I don't care if all you do is serve alcohol. It's fine. You know, wrong with that. You do do more than that. I, I, I agree with you. The little differences of thing, you know, I mean, it's delightful. Kids love it, parents love it. It's, it was a great idea. Great idea. So I'm I'm for that. What our discussion centered around last time was it's time it's it's time to make this look better. So you know, with the trailer you know what I mean. I mean you probably like it to look better also. A, a roof would be nice. And just can <coughs> What do you do in a ring? Oh, uh, well, yeah, the, the tent's out there now, the six month tent. Uh, but uh, yeah, moving forward, we'd love to have the Tiki Bar be a permanent uh, structure done the way it should be done. Um, you know, we've been working with this for a while, so our investment has really just been kind of waiting on knowing where to put it. But we're not, we're not trying to keep this going long term. We want to we invest, we want to move forward right. as well. You're trying to move into one of your two buildings, is that right. correct? We want to have a brick and mortar inside, but um, I don't want to mislead you. The outdoor space is the direction that downtown businesses can go and would like to go. Enzo's, um, Joni's, Brewery, Court, us over there, even the, the creamery, the popcorn shop, mm -hmm. the gazebo, Broken Earth, um, the country shop, but we're, we're all outdoors. And it's proven to bring business in even post COVID. And so this is, although we are, I call ourselves the front use on this B flying forward, um, the businesses are all planning to go the exact same direction. Well, they're not going to be outdoor only. They, they not only. Oh, and, and that's why we want to have it inside so that's that this is a seasonal outdoor thing. So yeah, we, we do want to move forward. We're not we're not fighting that, but you know we don't want to just throw resources. We want to try and get this plan. As you guys know, 1855 was kind of the plan going forward, and our architectural committee we gone through some hopes, and so we, the one that we presented tonight is hopefully one that we can like get done soon, so we can have that indoor brick and mortar. And we would still pursue something with that red building, but because it is such a big project. There's no way we can have that in time for next season. The tan bar, we feel confident we can get that up and running and have an indoor space for next season and then approach the red building a little more leisurely. So I, I, I will not vote beyond this year. Period. Just the, I remember last meeting, um, you had asked if anybody even you know, what were the comments from the public? Do they even like this place? Uh, I started a petition, um, just if you support Brother Shield and want to see it continue or not. Uh, because you you really, you didn't know. You were like, you know, and I was like, I could tell you all these people like it, but how can I prove it? Uh, we have over 500 signatures already, name, okay. numbers, so people who no support doubt. what we're doing. No doubt. And, and I see people enjoying themselves. This, and that's all good. You're a business in our community, and I want to support that. I would like it to look nicer, and that was that was the gist of the vote we took on the same month. So I will not do this again. With that said, with that said, um, does somebody want to make a motion? So moved. Can I? Can I just want to make sure that the board members are aware and, and Brothers Field is aware so that there's no misunderstanding that uh, if the board's approving the SET2, it's going to allow Brothers Field to operate their special events as well on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday within the hours of the liquor license and the business license, if you approve that SET2. In addition, there's a $750 uh, additional charge for that because of the additional days that are required by it. That is in the ordinance as well. 
and then issues related to the um, uh, serving outside the liquor license, I will have discussions with, I've already had discussions with Vic, I will have discussions with the owners of the business. Just want to make sure the board knows. Are structure is located? I'm sorry? For fee structure. Um, you know, at this point, we're willing to take what we can get. Um, you know, so I wouldn't. That's, well, the not, fee. that's not my main point of contention at this point. I think we just doubled it if you said that. Yeah, they yeah. And, um, and Again. It, <laughs> it, it doubled because when the village attorney pulled it together, it, they were looking at the hours and the volume of alcohol that's being sold over, over that period of time. And if you take 16 events and then you put every other Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on it, that's where the number came from. So was, was there a, a motion yep. to, to move the uh, approval of an ordinance amending the section 3.2.5.R of the Long Grove Village Code regarding temporary special liquor licenses? This would be to establish what? A uh, new SET2 license? Correct. Okay. And that was moved by Trustee O'Connor? Seconded by Trustee Tanucci. And that's a roll call. Trustee O'Connor. Aye. Trustee Tanucci. Aye. Trustee Borowski. I, with the caveat that I agree with Reed, I'm not voting on this again. <laughs> Just not. So, aye. Trustee Neal? Aye. All right. Motion carried. All right. Um, the um, now the next one is the discussion consideration approval of the Planning Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals of an amendment to the development plan for the Brothers Field. So maybe you want to take us through it. Basically, I, I sent the uh, Village Board members um, some drawings, three drawings that Brothers Field submitted to us. Uh, one of them to make sure everybody knew which farm we were talking about, and I, they did that for my benefit because I kept saying, which farm are we talking about? Um, also, the uh, uh, visual of the interior layout um, or how they want to proceed with it. And what they're asking to do is be referred, taking the exact same business model, um, but I don't think we've, we've cleared up if there's going to be food catering service or uh, catering, I forgot, the, initially our conversation was no kitchen. The, um, yeah, we did talk about that. We, we do have in one of the drawings I sent, which was the most recent one, we want to have a prep kitchen. Similar to what the larger facility was going to have, it wasn't going to have fryers and an ancillary system and all that, but a place where it's very easy to basically set up and serve. So if we want to have taco night, you can have taco night. If you've got a, a, a retirement party, you want to bring the end you can do it. So this one, the one drawing shows a little room where we're going to carve out space, so at least we can prepare and still have food there. Um, but as far as like making it on site, we, we were planning to do that with either one, but we do want to have it where it's very accessible and easy to bring in. This, this new um, concept that they're bringing forward, um, there was discussions with the Architectural Commission. They took a look at this. Um, they're bringing forward, it will, have, it will service less people than the Red Oak because it's a smaller interior. Um, the, what will ultimately happen here is once they get to the PCZBA, it's going to be an amendment, to, or it's going to be the creation of a new or an amendment to the existing PUD um, because the current PUD does not allow, um, doesn't have an allowance for this type of business and, and what was going to be done there. So what they're asking for right now is to take the same business model with a different building presented to the PZZBA or be referred to the PZZBA for next steps. How is it any different from the brewery? I don't understand the question. Well, they don't serve food. The brewery doesn't serve food because they're also a beer distributor and I think the statute doesn't allow them to turn on to serve food at the same time. Am I wrong about that? Oh, that's correct. That's so. Right. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. I'm an amateur. No. Okay. Um, what does that? Um. So hey. So the one thing though, I'm. I'm. So I, I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. Somehow we have to figure out how we make this work within our village code. I think the serving of food is key, and so that I'm just telling you, I don't know if this is going to work if you're not going to be serving food. When, when you don't, you know, special events and stuff. So I don't know how you do that and how you work that in, but I, I just think that's key for our downtown. Because otherwise, you're going to be operating as a bar, and we don't have that. And, and I know it's it's more than a bar. I got all that, so I don't want to get this, that whole thing going. But the food part, I think, is so key to, to fit it in. I mean, right. I just, 
I just want to figure out how do we adapt your business so that we can kind of come to some compromise where it fits into our village and you can continue to operate because it's good for us, right? And that's the only comment I have. I, I feel so strongly about that. Um, I, I literally had the power to shut you down by the board. I never did. I looked the other way many times and stuff kept going up and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And, you know, you, you establish a business for yourself. So all I ask is that you can figure out a way to work with us. And I know you got to go through our commissions. So that didn't mean that you had to go to the barn, you know, that just because of the architectural commission suggested that you may not be able to take the building down. We don't know that yet. It, it could be the case. It could be, you know, but don't, don't feel trapped in that. We just got to figure out how do we make your business fit into long growth so that we, you know, fits into our code and, and we don't set ourselves up for precedence where somebody else can come in and essentially do the same business you have somewhere else in the village that maybe it's on Towner's Green and they have, it's no longer, uh, it's, it's Towner's Field or something, right? So that's what I worry about. They have soup and sandwich? But that's what I mean, you can just figure out how to, how to do it. Um, and it's, I'll tell you, as somebody that goes out at night in the downtown on Fridays, um, it's hard to get food many times um, around here at night. It gets really crowded. So there is a need for it. We try to get it at Enzo's, uh, try to get into Joni's, um, Tavern Tit or Miss, uh, you know, um, Chatterbox is crazy. Yeah. So, the Chatterbox, one, one thing that's worked well for them, they, they got a food truck as well. Because um, their kitchen is so small, they just get overwhelmed really quickly. And so we've been parking their truck on, on our lot, and then it's worked out really well. Um, so it's not uncommon that they would be there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, serving food. Because, you know, to the point of business as well, people, they need to eat. And if they can eat, they'll stay and hang out longer. If we don't have food, we lose the business. So we always do our best to make sure we're providing some source of food for people to eat while they're there. Um, Code-wise, that means it would have to come from inside the building, and yeah, we'll, we'll try to approach that. But even as it is now, when we, when we have things, we have food available from somewhere. And if I can overstep my bounds too, I mean, I just, I have this vision of, you know, you have a tent there. Well, why couldn't that be a pavilion, sure. right? It could even have doors that enclose that. Um, it would give us a year round business. And it would adapt to the sound. And then your interior, whatever the, you know, the bar shape is inside, is it's all closed at night. So it's not, um, you know, a, a, a standalone tiki bar. Or, or you could set up a separate structure that, models a historic building to be your serving point. So um, I don't know, I just, I, I just think there's a way to make it work. And I know it, it requires a lot of planning, money, and getting through our process. But um, anyway, so I, I mean, if we refer to this, I still think you have the issue of how do you, how do you make it work, right? And how do you get it done for, by next year so we have a, yeah. a means to, so you can continue? So I, I, that's, that's what's got to all be figured out. That's where if we just kind of build a space, that's right. I don't want to give you the idea that we won't provide to it, just we won't be cooking it on the site. Mm -hmm. um, but there'll be a place where someone could come in and they they cook their food and they bring it all in and they basically put it like a taco truck or like food trucks are, but it would be inside. Right. Um, you know, the only thing that we would be minus would be fryers. That's kind of a whole other ball game once you get the fryers right. going. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't have that. But soup sandwiches that kind of thing I would, I would just, you know, you got, we've all talked about this. If, if you haven't yet, engage a land use attorney. I just was trying to. And, 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 you know, get that so he and Vic and Bob can start talking about the PUD. And um, reg, regulation is always about restriction. I mean, it's just the definition of it, at least from a public administration standpoint, public policy standpoint. But I would, I would, I gave this some thought over the last couple of days, and I would, See the Architectural Commission and the Planning Commission's own Board of Appeals as allies. I think they will give you some solid direction on what they would find acceptable, no, thinking that what we would find acceptable and based on code. So I, I just offer that up. Okay. So does anyone want to refer this? Make a motion to refer? So moved. Moved by Trustee Tanucci. We're referring it to the CCCBA. Yes. Yeah. And, and what's what's their action in this? I mean, are they looking at the plan as submitted, or are they going to probe these other areas and come back to us with something that 
meet your requirements of being more of that permanent enclosed space? I guess I'm asking the question. I don't want to send it to the committee and just say, hey, the board said massage this to make it look good. I, I don't want to send that message at all. I, mean, I guess that's my question. What are we actually referring and asking? The PTCBA should be looking at the existing code, what they're in compliance with and what they're not in compliance with, and then if there are things that they think are appropriate, make the recommendations so that the PUD can be adjusted to reflect those. Exactly. And then we, if that will be presented to the village board, and if that is consistent, obviously this puts the onus on business owners to come up with something that would be you facilitate some of the concerns you heard tonight, obviously, then you don't want to talk to the PCCBA, hear what they're suggesting, then eventually it comes back to the village board, and we can, if it were, we'll try to, we'll all work together, and if you contact the and others, we will work with you to try to create an amendment to the PED that both serves your business, is consistent with the village code, and is done quickly, so that you can do it. The architectural commission will be probably an equally as important partner on talking about the appearance and how it's going to look. Like that. Okay, so we have um, referred by Trustee Tanushi, seconded by Trustee O'Connor. It's a roll call. Trustee Tanushi. Aye. Trustee O'Connor. Aye. Trustee Brodsky. Aye. Did you mail? Aye. All right, motion carried. Thank you. Okay, um, discussion and consideration of corrective action for town or subdivision drainage stormwater issue, and I think uh, Jeff Perry provided a very uh, engineering looking like document to us. Um, and I'll uh, let him describe, but uh, it's talking about will the pipe the both handle the water? And then I yeah. think there's some other updates that you have that we're all curious to hear. So, okay, so kind of subdivision. Let's get the shortened version. Though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, I want him to go through all those numbers because I did too. Only to get to the bottom of the page that it will handle 70% of the <laughs> cases work. will be handled, right? Does it work, up, yeah. Does it work or not? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Counter subdivision, we're talking about the uh, the 12 inch pipe that will uh, take flows away from the rear yards of uh, 7054 Osage Road and the other properties that are northeast of Osage. So a couple updates on this. Uh, first of all, not the memo, but with the grant funding opportunity. Uh, talked about the last meeting opportunities with Lake County Stormwater Management to get either a watershed management board grant or a stormwater infrastructure repair fund grant. Uh, initial conversations with uh, Lake County Stormwater Management were our budget uh, is tight, maybe not this year. Uh, last week, uh, I got correspondence back from Lake County SMC that the staff spoke with their executive director. Uh, just kind of going back a step, uh, you know, I mentioned that the executive director, you know, he's got the authority to approve and uh, move surf projects, stormwater infrastructure repair fund projects forward. Any time during the year. So anyway, I uh, got correspondence from them that uh, they said, hey, you know, they looked at the project, uh, see an opportunity there, send in an application. So they didn't guarantee um, a grant this year um, or success of the grant, but uh, the communication was very positive in my mind. So we'll work through uh, putting an application together and getting that over to Lake County Stormwater Management. Uh, just to uh, look uh, Reminder, the Lake County Stormwater Infrastructure Repair Fund grants, or for short, is a 50-50 uh, match grant, uh, and the maximum grant funding is $50,000. So the project could cost just over $100,000, it would be pretty very close to $50,000. Um, the other update, um, the, uh, the very technical geek memo here, um, the question had been, uh, so we got a 12-inch pipe, how much what level of protection and how many, what frequency of storms that are going to handle. So, did a lot of engineering calculations, looked at a lot of uh, rainfall uh, data from last year. If you're curious, when it rained last year, how much rain we got. It's all in the chart there. So, we get that from the uh, Cocoa Res uh, weather station in Buffalo Grove. Any collaborative rain, hail, and snow network. So, anyway. We didn't need to know that. These numbers, yeah. these numbers they gave us. Anyway. Long story short, uh, based on the rain, the rain we got last year, the pipe would handle 70% of those storms. So there'd only be 30% that would uh, um, over surcharge the capacity of that. Yeah, so there, there you go. So that's the second part. So still 70% um, of the water would be 
I mean, would be going through and then be overflow in that situation that would come into their yards potentially. Yep. Parts of their basement. Yard, yards, hopefully. <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the goal with any overflow and underground drainage is also to it, um, help dry the, the land. Right now, you've got a lot of water in your rear yards and your side yards. Um, and one of the big reasons is it's super saturated. There's just no capacity to the ground. Go ahead. You take 70% of the storms and don't go through there, that helps that land dry out. So when you do get that storm, it does have some infiltration capacity. Right. And will this also take care of the stretch where we first pull in on the east? The why? Where, where, where there's, there's two houses that needed the swale contoured, I think that was the... Yeah, we need to, that, that swale does need to get regraded so that it flows from meadow to Ravenna East. Correct. And is that part of this, or is the 100,000... The 100,000 was the storm sewer pipe. Um, okay. I would recommend, you know, while in town or when you get the contractor out there that would be a great time to regrade that as well. That will be a minor cost compared to the pipe. Yeah. Well, said, you know, we can't write checks for this. Is an SSA a possibility or is that I would I would venture to guess based off conversation with the uh, residents over there that the participation required for an SSA wouldn't be able to be achieved, so I think it would uh, it would it would be difficult. It uh, if the board's inclined to to do this work, um, the engineering work's already been done. We need to file the grant with SMC, uh, see what happens with that, and then uh, President Jacob and I have meetings with uh, County Board Chair and uh, County Board Rep. Tomorrow, Altenburg. tomorrow, Altenburg, tomorrow. So you got a good opportunity us, for us to ask about funding associated with, uh, or funding that may be available, so we can have those conversations. But if the board is so, if the board wants to put money aside in the capital improvement plan to potentially support a grant that comes in, um, that's something we would have to do too, and you know, make an amendment to the budget. Jeff, does it help at all if the residents were to fix their drain tiles? Like, somewhere we can like motivate them, compel them, and help them if the drain tiles actually work? I mean, for that yeah. other thirty percent runoff, I mean, is that? I can. I can. I'm well, asking Jeff. Thank you. I appreciate it. So it won't help with the thirty percent that's going to go that way, but that drain tile would help um, dry out that area. Um, so that it restores the infiltration capacity when that water does come back. Yeah. Talked about their uh, culverts as well, where over the years Do we have authority to make that happen? Uh, so there's culverts um, on the stage. Or I should say it's the uh, the ditch. Uh, Dry pro properties that have been filled in over the years. Um, sediment in there, a little bit of self-help, you know, uh, assortment of things. But wanted to lean on the residents there to help clean it up. Yeah, this is this ditch on um, uh, not within a bubble right away, but within the, within the village right away. Correct. Because it, it causing us to fill in the. We can encourage them to clean it up. We can also tell them to clean it up ourselves. It's, we have that authority. Okay. We, talk, we did talk about drain tiles last time. Correct. That we we don't know if we don't know where they are and what shape they're in. Correct. And was it your recommendation to to explore that or to just say let's just take care of it? With yeah, that? I think that should still be explored. Um, and. You know, that, those drain tiles are on private property, so I would recommend that you go back to the homeowners to collaborate and, and work through that. Um, the village doesn't have, I would suggest the village doesn't take any uh, responsibility for those. 
That was that's your recommendation as well. Yeah. Right. Given the age of the drain tiles, it's probably not worth the three thousand to figure out where they're at. Put that three thousand toward just putting new ones in. That would be can, correct. Can, can I? Can, uh, yeah, go ahead. Most of the drain tiles, all the drain tiles that we would be located, which we have found from the past uh, from a private company, are clay. That's all we Having the glass and or clay or their days are very easily infiltrated by roots. So, yes, if you were with as old as they are and if you try to clean them up or rather with root cutters and stuff like that, you're just going to destroy the drain. Correct. Yeah, would be better off to just put new in. Mm -hmm. And as for the the boards, um, I know in the past we've talked about the culverts underneath the driveways or in the right away and stuff like that. And you know, we we have actually, I myself have talked to one resident in general. The reason that the uh, front yard floods is 7056 is because the culvert directly across the street from that at uh, I believe it's uh, 7061. Is partially collapsed. Uh, myself and my father, rest his soul, had talked to that resident several times, and the resident just says, Yeah, 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 and it's done nothing. Is there anything, even though we're still working on the grand of things to get the piping in, is there anything that we can do in the meantime to start something, getting that resident to fix their culvert? Because at least then the water will build up on the on the one side of the driveway. It goes over the road, and that's what floods out the front yard of seven zero five six. So basically, being neighbor to neighbor over the last five years has gotten seven zero five six no problem. Is this the covered under the driveway? Yes. Oh. Right now it's been so dry. If you lay down and you try to look through the culvert, you cannot see all the way through it because it is partially closed. What is the cost to clear that out? Clear that out? Um, depending on what's in there, if something is easily removed, um, somebody like you know, the township can come and clear that out in a couple of hours. The culvert's owned by the pro the culvert's owned by the property. Correct. Right. Yep. Is it a property? Uh, we need to be careful. We need to be careful what we're doing in private yeah, property. Yeah. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, we, we, we if. If the desire was for the to have the township or any other village conduct do the work, then we would need to have permissions and indemnities because <laughs> and, right, and all that's you know the cost well, of that would exceed. Yeah. But can somebody take a look? Well, we had the engineering study done. I didn't know if it was possible where the village could at least write a letter to the homeowner and say that we've noticed in our engineering study with the water yeah. loss by having that conversation. That yeah. There is a compromise culvert, and you know you need to replace this in a certain amount of time. If not. You know, we do it. We do. I. I don't know. I just. I know in the past the village board has recommended neighbor to neighbor and that. Okay. Can Can we just step back a second? So is this one that Jeff? Did you document the this, or can somebody look at it and assess if if it's blocked or collapsed? Yeah, we'll take a look at it. And then from there, a decision can be made on how to approach mm -hmm. being be it um, whatever, whatever that might be. Uh, force the homeowner to do it or whatever, but you'll then at least have a data point to, to work with. So, and then I have one other comment if I can back up a second too. Um, we're gonna, we're looking for funding to do this right, so the grant, we're asking other sources. I will add that, um, and I hope I have the right street, but in country clubs and states we had a similar situation like this and we did get some funding and we also pitched in on Shenandoah, remember that? And it was um, one of these problems that was going on for such a long time, a similar situation, and, you know, we did it. And as I've said, uh, you know, and I, I know that we don't want to ex overextend ourselves and say we're going to do these things everywhere, but where we can help the residents, where it makes sense and it's a unique situation, in my opinion, we should be doing that. But that's just how I feel. So it's your all's decision. And I don't know, I haven't heard uh, from you yet on this one. Um, Okay, thank you. So I don't know what you need tonight is to go uh, apply for the grant, right? Yep. I mean, uh, am I hearing any no's to apply for the grant? Do it. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? All I have. All right. Excellent report. All right. Um, 
Moving right along, and now another one that will be interesting, perhaps, maybe not. Um, this is discussion and consideration of, of Country Club Meadows HOA for access to right away for installation of two, no, of uh, block cameras. There's two of them. And um, a lot of work's happened since the last time, and I actually did ask for this to be put back on the agenda. Um, you know, one of the things that one of the biggest issues that we had was privacy, that the HOA was going to have all the data. And I, I, you know, because of Village Manager Jackson um, brokering a meeting with Flock, there's now a, what, an intergovernmental agreement or a, um, what would you call that between the Sheriff's Department and the uh, the concern the concern that was raised, which was a very legitimate concern, is how is the data being retained, how who's got access to it, and how is it being used, and uh, what we what we came to find out was that. Uh, if a car was detected to, if a car came into a give to to this subdivision, and just drove through, there was no mechanism to alert law enforcement on it. It would have to be an after the fact type of situation. So they would use the tape to identify this vehicle being in the subdivision. Well, it turned out. It used to be. Well, it turned out that the sheriff's but because of this, what law enforcement does is it has an agreement with subdivisions. To uh, um, go ahead and be notified if something comes in. I we'll defer to your lengthy background in that. But uh, so there would be an alert. If it was on a hot sheet, it was part of an amber alert, this flock camera would turn around and notify the local law enforcement agency. That agreement did not exist with the Sheriff's Department. Right. I met with the commands at, at the uh, direction of the village president, I met with the command staff. Um, of the Sheriff's Department, two deputy chiefs and Kevin, uh, Keith Kaiser, would ultimately went to the under sheriff and then the sheriff to have a memo of understanding with each individual subdivision that when the flock camera saw something that was on the hit sheet, they would notify that law enforcement agency. By doing that, the country clubs, uh, uh, Meadows, who are, who are the requester here, now can virtually take their hands totally off the data. Um, they, they still have rights to the data because they are the contractor to Flock, but they virtually have their hands off the data. Flock had said when we were talking, because I brought up some of the concerns that a couple of the trustees made, I said to him, I said, you know, our concern is law enforcement not having this and it's sitting in the hands of Joe Public that could do it any way he wants. Flock came out and said, our preference is that law enforcement has it, and, and there's limited to no uh, use on the part of the subdivision um, because of the fact of exactly what you said about how they would use it or could misuse it. So they came out with, uh, and I put this in the package, Black came out and, and adapted their camera use policy based off of what Flock had given them to use, which minimizes significantly the hands on that. Um, that was pretty much all my mission was. <laughs> so. so that's a big change from the last vote we took. Um, the data goes to the Sheriff's Department, where in the last time we took this vote it did not. And it's hands off for the HOA, except for very specific situations. Like if there was an incident and the police report was written, whoever was Whoever's name is on that police board, maybe basically the victim, I suppose, if they want to request the data for some reason, they could do that. But you can't just go in and say, oh, let's see what happened today. Very slightly regulated. And, and the right away, it's our right away. So I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, I didn't ask Vic this, but we, we can turn around and take away our access to the right away if we find there's something yeah, nefarious being done. Right. They, they, they're before they, uh, one of the conditions of the approval that we prepared was that they sign a license agreement and basically they, if they do anything, uh, violate any any understanding that we have, and we can clarify it. In the, if there's a specific concern that the board has, we can insert it into the agreement to say that if you, you conduct yourself by these following standards, these, you know, this information can be transmitted to local law enforcement, you're not, I mean, whatever the village board's concerns are, it's in the agreement, and if they violate it, we terminate the agreement, they have to remove the uh, cameras at no cost to us. And I, I think it's important to know, because I'm, I'm not sure who may be listening in via Zoom, but the concerns that were raised by board members uh, about the flat cameras weren't unique to this board. 
that what, what was brought up with concerns were legitimate concerns that were brought up by other like bodies when they're turning around and making a decision of bringing something like this into the community where they have their fingerprints on it to some extent. Privacy was first and foremost. Racial profiling was another concern that was brought up. Uh, property values and the impact on property values. And there are some arguments that when you put, put these cameras there, it gives a sense that the property, there are some issues at the property. On the other side, it can be perceived like a gated community where it's more valuable over there in the property. So there wasn't any clear you know, relationship that, that I could find in all the data I was looking at. But the concerns were legitimate. And, and uh, they, I think they needed to, in my opinion, for it to be reintroduced, which is what the uh, HOA was asking for, those things had to be looked at and had to be addressed. You know, it was interesting. We had the HOA president's meeting last Tuesday, and um, several subdivisions are looking at it or have put them in. And one of the things they learned is they didn't realize that they now can give the sheriff direct access to their video. So I think, you know, Briarcrest is one that, um, you know, it, that's going to, you know, Jeff Wilson is going to be looking at, and, and there's others. So. Brooks, Brookstone, who put the first ones in town, came up to me after the meeting, and they said, we didn't know the sheriff's department would get that data. And now the, Keith Kaiser, who was there, is now setting up a memos of understanding with each of those subdivisions to go ahead and meet, meet their needs. So, But that was my whole argument all along, is that, yeah, you have this stuff coming in, and if the people that need to use it can't access it. What good is it, right? So, et cetera. But it, and it's neat to see then that um, now other subdivisions can also tap into the work that you did. And I thank you for that, you know, broking the meeting with Flock and the Sheriff Department. So, and we're seeing, because of that, I think there's other cameras now, now that they're monitoring throughout the uh, Lake County, right? It, 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 exactly. They're doing, uh, they just did Green Oaks and, and, and Matawa. Um, the end goal on this, were, I guess, was two things. Take the data out of the hands who, of people who could potentially misuse it and make it a, a, a responsive uh, um, measure for police versus reactive. Right. Now, the other thing is, if I understand correctly, this is not a permanent thing right now. We're still doing it on a pilot basis, right? Two years. To, to your pilot, but with, which we can back out for the reasons we said. but seeing if this works. And if it works, I mean, there could be a situation where we decide to install cameras, you know, the village decides to install them in certain spots. So um, we can do that? We can, yeah. I know we can't do red light cameras, is that correct? Right. right. But we can do these. Yes. No. And in fact, if you go... Why the distinction? Red red. Well, the, the distinction um, is, yeah, it's, it's that it, one's information, one's enforcement. Got so, um, okay. and I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, I, worked a case once where uh, these things were very helpful, where they, it was a, uh, a, a bank robbery, and because of these types of cameras, uh, the FBI was able to trace the route of the car, exactly where it went, where it picked up the cohorts, and where every single thing, and it's these, um, it, it's, it's exactly what you're trying to describe. So, okay. What's your metric on success? You said, if they work. I mean, they're going to take pictures of license plates, but how do you measure success? I don't know, I guess, I mean, I, I guess well, just described if we actually that's catch somebody. Anecdotal. That's not database, that's anecdotal. They got lucky, right? Here, our, our, our crime, the, uh, the home invasions, that we, the robberies have all been on foot. Not all, but a lot of them have been on foot. No cars have been involved. People well, are walking out of the woods. Right, well, yeah, but where, right? A couple miles away is what the sheriff told us. They're not like parking across the street and going in your back door. So it's been anecdotal, or that's anecdotal. So we have people on foot, we have cars parked far away on these on these robberies, and we have a lot of cars being stolen, being used in a crime long before they're reported stolen because they're stolen at midnight, crimes committed, and they're, they're done by morning. So they don't even appear in the databases. That's been the pattern we've had up here. So, so again, the point, the question, not an anecdote. I get it. You got cameras everywhere. You could follow a car around. I get it. But well, how do we measure success? I mean, if, if you had to, if, if you had to quantify it, in, in all fairness, if you had to quantify it, there's so many variables in there that you could say caused a robbery not to happen or a burglary not to happen. Could have been a patrol car that was by. Could have been so right. It could have right. could have been somebody having their alarm on 
and it, it activated because they came up to it. So um, I, I would say if I was doing it from, from a research standpoint to turn around and actually quantify um, what the deterrent value was or, or catching somebody, that would be very difficult just because there's so many other things that come into play. There's other sides of it where um, Gurney Mills has them out and 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 they're and they're and they're catching the bad guys. You got bad guys with stolen cars that are turning around, and coming down through main thoroughfares up on Grand Avenue and all through that. And and those applications, by all accounts in law enforcement, I talked to the chief out in Barrington. I've talked to a couple other uh, chiefs. Uh, uh, the chief out in Highland Park. He says, when we've got it and we've got them positioned where we need them to be positioned on 41 and things like that, he said, it works good for us. He says it's been success. How do you quantify something like that in a inner subdivision off some side streets? Yeah. I, I think that could be I think that could be a little bit tough. It doesn't mean that they don't serve as deterrents, and it doesn't mean that somewhere uh, and, and something could happen where they catch it. But I could not sit here and straight say I can quantify that there'd be a sixty percent reduction the in the bad, bad guys are sophisticated. If they see cameras, they're not going to go that way. They're going to walk this in your backyard. Well, so I mean, the, the more anecdotal stuff. Um, it's Brooksville, right? They they said that since they put the cameras up, they've had less traffic, less traffic, and um, and no break-ins, right? So um, they they believe it's a deterrent for them that people really? see that camera. Brooksville, um, Brooksville, right off of Checker Road. Oh, okay. Um, in Schaefer, there you can get on either side, and they okay. they they suggest that it's helped them out. So um, I don't know. They, can I add a couple thoughts? So yeah, I, you know, I talked to Greg a while ago. Um, you know, to me, if we're going to go this way, why don't we take the X number of entrances and exits to the village, figure out where we position cameras, and just put them in ourselves. Take the HOAs out of it. Why do we want every HOA in the village to propagate more cameras standing on the corner? Well, it's not that we want it necessarily. It's that we're allowing it. It's their choice. The HOAs, well, the HOAs themselves on their private roads have the ability to do it. You can understand. do it in your subdivision understand. as we can in ours. Right? Understand. So, so that's my question. Why don't we evaluate the village as a whole, take a look at the entrances and exits of the village, and figure out where we can position 20 cameras, catch all the outside traffic coming in and out of the village, and we're done, instead of every HOA popping cameras in everywhere. I don't know what that would cost, but there aren't that many roads in and out of the village. How much is it per year? It it depends. Prices are coming down. It was at five thousand dollars per camera, and then and some discussion with Keith. It was uh, they've reduced the prices to about three thousand dollars per camera per year, and that's with the maintenance and everything else that goes with. We're it. basically leasing it. That's fine. So I don't know. How many, correct. I don't know how many cameras that is. So I, I was wondering if maybe you know if maybe Jeff can plot it out and say we need eighteen cameras and we need them positioned in these locations, or we move them around, you know, maybe we figure out where the bad guys are coming and going. That's one thing, that's one thought I had. The other thought, instead of everybody just putting cameras up, right? I mean, we have setbacks for a reason. We have, you know, green space for a reason. We, I didn't want uh, pole-mounted solar panels for a reason. You know, I just want green, right? I don't want all this stuff. But who actually owns the data? Who owns it? The data is owned by the HOA. Okay, so Bank of America, famous case right now, right? They took all their credit card data and voluntarily gave it to the FBI without a subpoena to track which credit cards were in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. I don't want an HOA to go, hey, I got Chris Barocki going back and forth just because I do. Here, here, who wants it? So the ownership of the data to me is a problem as well, and that's why I really think Taking it out of hands of the owner, out of the HOAs, putting it into the municipal domain. When we control the data, we secure the data. We can control everybody. Kind of, we can monitor everybody. Kind of coming in and out of the village, looking for the bad guys. I'm all for that. But for every HOA to pop these things up on every corner, I'm not interested. How, how are they mounted? On a pole. On a pole. You you go into Vernon Hills. Uh, like there, you go by them all the time on 60 and. Yeah. Um, it's over the hills. They're all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. I would look at them if you did a one-way sign or a stop sign. Look at the height of that sign because, yeah. Yeah. Go go down the checker road and look at theirs on uh, Brookstone. Uh -huh. And it also yeah. depends where you want your angle to get things. So. And my last thought was 
notifying people that we're doing this. I know Brookstone has a little sign sounded there, but to me, if we're going to allow this, we ought to put like a big old warning sign up in front saying, hey, if you enter this subdivision, you're on candid camera. I think we need to alert the travelers going in and out of that area and let them decide if they're good guys or bad guys. You have to do that. You have to, you know, you have signs in here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I put that in uh, the policy paper that I wrote up with the recommendations. Yeah. I put in, you know, make sure we have language that says smile. So, so you have an HOA. Very helpful. You have an you have an HOA here that that wants to do wants to take some action. They have they've gotten the money to do it. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on how you look at it. They have publicly maintained roads, right? So you get the good with the bad with that. Um, you know, good is you don't have to pay for the road repair. The bad is that's a pretty good. good. <laughs> but the bad is you can't do something like this without the village approval. So I still am, I, I got your point, Chris, on, you know, how do you measure success? And I don't know how we do that exactly yet, but I still would love to see, even while maybe we do make this a study, that we do allow this situation to happen. And if the village decides to put cameras up, they may not have to pay for them in the future. And they'll get it for free. If, if those are locations that we select to put cameras or maybe we put them slightly in a different spot, which they would benefit from. The conversation was interesting on Tuesday night, yeah. but, um, somebody in the crowd said, well, so what good does it do, you know, we were robbed, you know, the robbers in the neighborhood, and just need to put masking tape over the license plate numbers. And the response was, their technology is such that it doesn't just take the plate, it takes the back of the car. And they can they can determine the make and model of the vehicle because of the way the car is built. Mm -hmm. So that gives them it, it may not give them the number, but it gives them enough to start looking for certain make model and so on and so forth. And you know there there was a lot. It was a really very good discussion. I, I, uh, I, I would I would say this the. the um, Trustee Borowski and I uh, met last week on, on, we're at the final year of our agreement with the Sheriff's Department for law enforcement services, so we had some discussions. I, I think it, rather than being casual and we'll get to it type thing, I think it merits the study of looking at the ins and outs of town and, and seeing what it would cost us to put a system like this in. I, I, I think it brings value, um, especially as big as we are, 1.5 miles. And, and I don't think, I agree with you, Chris, I don't think we've got 500 entrances in the town. It's not that many. I think we're going to, I think we're going to narrow it down. And I think this could be something that could be a significant value to the village. And I bring that up from the way I'm hearing, not about subdivisions, but the police departments that I'm talking to and the chiefs in those departments who swear by this and say, you know what, you put it in the right place, it's going to have an impact. Barrington had those car, uh, car dealerships hit. And that was the, we were at the meeting with all the mayors when they said, It's kind of a duh, but only it's not until you hear it where they had a success. We've had a succession of robberies, and and uh, the officer immediately said they were in your community before they robbed you. Casing it, obviously. Yeah, obviously you don't just drive in. You know, go that one looks good. And and it occurred to me when he said that that mm -hmm. if there's enough data, they. They, they, can they string it together. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Doctor Jamil, you've been silent on this one. Do you have any? Well, I'm against this. Privacy. They enjoy access to it. Privacy. Have the right to be free. Leads to a lot of problems. Individually, the residents can have their own cameras. You know. And as far as the businesses are concerned, they have their own cameras to monitor. I don't think the burglar should be the main event going uh, out every day with multiple events in that case. I think I'm against this. Did you read the privacy policy offered in the subdivision? Yeah, I mean, I read this uh, document nice. which is in the agenda. Uh, yeah, principally, I'm against this. Okay. 
Um, and Chris, where are you at? Not a fan. I prefer to defer until we can study the village and see if it makes sense to village wide. I really don't want an HOA owning that data. I really, really don't. But the private HOAs are doing it, and we can't control that. Let me let me ask another question. So if 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 this was passed and we said that the HOA can't access the data, would it change it? Access it was the sheriff place. They set it up in that manner. I'm not. I'm not certain. Where it's a hundred percent. Yeah. Not, I'm not sure. We're paying yeah. for it. Yeah. They're, they, that's why. That's why they brought it down to this really, really minimal. Because I did the follow up on it. This real minimal use, where they've got to go through a committee to get it done. But yeah. And I think the data only stays for thirty days, and then it, then it goes away, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I mean, I can ask that question. I'm just not certain that because they're the ones with, in, engaged with Flock that they're not entitled to the data, unless they fully agree to relinquish it all. But right. would that but change your mind? That. Would that change your position? Yes, that HOA has uh, community uh, residents consensus to do this. Yes. Yeah, it was one of the first questions we asked. Where you know, how this even got to our desk was back in 2022. We got a call from a resident who said, or I'm sorry, an email from a resident who said, they're going to put up the flat cameras, don't they have to get permits through you? And I was like, what are you talking about? And then all of a sudden I got a hold of the HOA and then I got a hold of Flock and I said, you're on public right away. I said, you can't do anything without coming to us first. And I checked with Vic to make sure I wasn't overstepping and I wasn't. And uh, uh, that's how we put the brakes on it. And that's how we got to where we're at right now. You, I mean, the agreement, you'd have to really look at that agreement between the HOA and FLOC because it would have to be something that, the, you know, the HOA isn't entitled to it. FLOC's not going to ever volunteer this information because this would be an unusual situation and you wouldn't want to have a situation where an employee at FLOC would just, without consulting the agreement, treat the HOA like anybody else and suddenly you get a, a dump of information. So, uh, and I guess I don't know FLOC is even willing to, to, right. to entertain such an agreement. Obviously, none of that. In the, I would imagine in the agreement right now. Well, sensing that um, the two opinions here on the board um, similar, um, we probably can't move this along tonight, but we could perhaps two things. One that came out of this is start, and I, I know we don't, have, we have so many projects going on, but maybe there's some way to do it. Yeah, I think I can get law enforcement to work with us. Okay. This start a, a project to what if we took on installing cameras, what would we do that, right? I think everyone, you're good with that, right? It also, you know, has uh, need to put uh, the notice to the entire, because if you're blocking, the, you know, having the cameras at the intersections where they enter, you know, I'm not sure if that is not for the traffic. You know, how are we going to, uh, probably the village attorney can tell us. If somebody complains that, you know, without, so people have to be informed at a large level that we are doing this for long road. Well, if we're doing that. So if somebody files a suit against us, if they got violated with the privacy or not knowing anything. Well, there are well, cameras already at all of these intersections. Yeah. Operated by Illinois Department of Transportation. Like County Transportation. Of transportation. From, from a legal perspective, filming somebody, what you don't want to be filming cars on the road in public. So that is falls under the plain view doctrine. You have no expectation of privacy in public. For the same reason, I can go outside in the parking lot and just take a photo of anybody's car. I can take a photo of a car on the street. There's no privacy violation by simply taking that photograph. The violations happen when what you do with that information. So typically, you know, if you're using that information for some sort of improper purpose, okay. I know this board is concerned about uh, profiling and things of that nature. That's that's where the issue is going to come up. Um, and so it's it, it can come up. Depending on what is what is done with the information, right? But the simple act of taking uh, photographs in a public area is not a privacy violation. So was that include faces? Was there something in the document that said faces? There's no face photos. No, no face, no facial photos whatsoever. So, so the second thing was to is to go back to the HOA and say, hey, would you relinquish? And, 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 the, and the contract states that the only person that can access the data is the sheriff department, right? Yeah. Did we do that previously, or have we done that? No. No. No, no. no there, there's, there, those are on private property. Right. It's right. their data, right? 
right. and they were just using it themselves. Right. Now they have access. The good thing is the sheriff police can have direct access right. to the data, which is good, is very helpful to them. Right. This is this is only the second time this is coming before the board. It was a reintroduction off of we saying no the first time. And this would be something too you'd want to have it only. Um, they could get the information by FOIA. So you would want to just, if it's a private ongoing investigation, that's a FOIA exemption. So the sheriff asks, gets, part of, then, then they can keep it private. Unless, then, it, unless it's the alert information because they got a hit. Right, but then the investigation would immediately commence right. upon the alert, yes. So for the cameras that are up, Greg, have we enforced setback lines or do, are these not subject to they're not, setback lines? Yeah, they're not ours. They're not on ours. They've got it. All on no, no, like residential setback lines. You, know, you can't build within whatever it is, 40 feet of the border of the property. I mean, you know, people, because I'm thinking about the one on Schaefer Checker on the driveway there at the Hobbit House. And, I mean, I see the camera, I see the little sign, but it can't be more than 10 feet off the roadway. Intentionally, I don't know why. But yeah, I, I, I will tell you that. that subject to set that normal setback. I'll, I'll have to check. The, I'll have to check with our with our zoning people. The, I, I would tell you that Brookstone. That was up before I got here, so I can't I can't, of, I can't yeah. speak to that. Um, but the privately held, the privately owned uh, roads, subdivisions with private private uh, roads, nobody has contacted contacted us. Stephen, let us know. We hear about it because somebody tells us about it. I mean, that's the old, you know, the old. Uh, it's like '83 and the flags, right? I mean, can somebody put a pole wherever they want to put a pole, and or is that subject to? Rest of the codes that we have, including setbacks. Setbacks are for buildings, though. It's a building. It's a pole. It's a man-made structure, right? Yeah, for structures that doesn't look at. I, I haven't read that. So, as an HOA president, I never asked permission to put a stop sign, several stop signs in my subdivision on the privately maintained roads. So, I would expect the same thing that I wouldn't have to ask permission to put a pole in. And I think that's what the HOAs have done. They haven't told us because they because we're st we were stuck. We're stuck with everything. You know, as you know, um, stormwater management, um, snow removal, salt, wetlands, pathways. I mean, you name it. It's I get that. But but then it, there's that uh, con potential conflict of somebody coming in and saying, "Hey, I want to build this pole right here," and uh, the village board say, "No, you can't build your pole there." But we've allowed our <coughs> people to build poles within the setbacks. Yeah, but these are tiny poles that are like the size of a stop sign. Does it matter? I don't know. I mean, you're, I mean, it, I, I mean, again, is that something we want to regulate? I suppose we could, you know. Well, I'm just curious. At what point, you know, where do you, where do you cross the line? Is it ten foot pole or ten inch pole? Okay, not okay, but they're I mean, pretty. I know. I've seen them. I know what they are. Can we get yeah. back to the camera discussion? Well, we kind of still are because it leads to: Do we regulate the other HOAs on notification? To the privacy question and make sure that they're installed safely or I mean it's it's a it's a structure going on a lot is that not a permittable thing should we not require permits for that I mean somebody's putting whatever they're putting on. <laughs> I mean how's that different than the question is, uh, whoever is coming in and out of long growth is being scanned And how long the data is going to be in the system? You could shut down, we could shut down our roads and gate our community and, um, and, and really limit the amount of people that come in. We could do that. That's one of the things that we actually considered when we had some burglaries a long time ago, long before um, you lived in our subdivision. We had some burglaries, and we had some instances. And um, you know, we, we were thinking about do we gate the community? We were also thinking about trying to install cameras back before we had technology like this. Can we get some kind of a closed circuit TV, and we have somebody with a VCR and plug it in their house? I mean, that's what we were trying to do. Now we have technology, you know, wide area network technology where this stuff can be sent, and it's it's so much better. But um, and it was a beta VCR. It could have been a beta. That's what, yeah, I know. Sorry, I'm showing my age. But anyways. He doesn't even know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but so so let's get back. We're, it's going at 9 o'clock. Um, but, but, well, let's hold on a second. Yeah, it did. It did raise the top. But it's like 
study this um, more village wide. There is some discussion about it, does it have to be regulated? The posts be regulated. Um, there is some discussion about would, can a contract be formed so that that, that they, the HOA can't access the data, right? Correct. Um, there is the issue, um, <clears throat> Trustee Jamil, uh, about uh, privacy, very concerned about that still, and, and so forth. Um, some of that's been addressed in some of the material that we have, but maybe we can table it here and get stuff. How would your city different from being on people in your if I was Not on our property. If I, but if, I, if I'm walking on the sidewalk, they've got me on their main doorbell and they can do whatever they want with that information. It's kind right. of the same difference. Yeah, from a legal you're, you're, you're out in the public. Right, that's the point, doctor. No expectation of privacy. Exactly. If you're in the public, anybody can film you for any reason. Correct. Right. If you're if you're allowed to yeah if you're walking the written you don't need any permission right. you can just do anything you want with that video. Correct. Right. But those cameras you know they have the settings that the data disappears. Correct. There will be no Correct. record that come in after a month and say who walked near your yeah. and you drive it. Nobody can tell. Yeah, I mean, does the have an to review the video. Those yeah, if, if, if you, you can grab it, that's your video, you can give it to the You can keep it, you can do whatever you want with it. You, you can actually you make an agreement with Ring to take your Ring video. Right. Yeah. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep us moving, everyone. So, no. <laughs> we, we could make it permissible just so we know, and, and law enforcement knows, at no charge. We don't have to charge for it, but we would ask maybe to solve that for you. What was your first verb? Permittable. 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 Is that a verb? I have no it's idea if it's a real word or not. <laughs> we don't have to charge, but, but then, then we could get the memorandum. Well, we used to have to uh, register our burger alarms too, but I don't right. think we do that anymore either. But Just anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, one, no one does that anymore. But anyway, never mind. All right. Um, are we? Can we stop here? Yes. Thank you for the discussion. All right. I know it's getting late. Um, so there's there's one, two, three, four, five items that pertain to Brothers Field. So we we spread it around a little bit on Brothers Field, I guess, to keep you here, so we'd have an audience. <laughs> Um, I actually have no idea how it ended up this way. Trying to air and out early too. Um, so I'm gonna. So the, yeah. So there's discussion, consideration, approval of special benefit application submitted by Brothers Field for the Fairy Tale Festival. Then there's the um, Family Night at Brothers Field. There's the Blues Fest. There's Christmas in July, and then um, another Family Night. Right. So there's the one, two, three, four, five. Any questions, or does somebody want to make a motion to approve them? Can we just recheck the hours that are on each one of them? When I looked through them, I thought one of them had later hours. Maybe I misread. Yeah, them. one of them did, and um, you have it in the manager's report. Greg put it on there. Mm -hmm. So there's one that goes to 11 o'clock, but that was, I think, a family night, right? That is a uh, family. Yeah, it's a family, family night. night. Or it's themed. So it's all 11 o'clock. That's the 10, 10 30 earlier. All 10, 10 30. That one's 11 o'clock though. Yeah. But it's for um, what's going to happen at that? It's a movie. Movie. Okay. And that may make sense because daylight is a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. um, to, you, know, you can't do it till like 9 o'clock, right? Yeah. So somebody want to make a motion to approve? Make a motion to approve all five. Okay. Yes, uh, all five. Uh, moved by Trustee Tanucci. Second by Trustee Jamil. Roll, roll call, please. Trustee Tanucci. Aye. Trustee Jamil. Aye. Trustee Grassi. Aye. Trustee O'Connor. Aye. All right, motion carried. You can go now if you want. <laughs> and, and, uh, just one question for the special permits. Like, these are all like big, uh, big standards. Is there like, what, um, does a guy with a tambourine out there count as a special permit? Like, when does it cross? If it's Bob Dylan. Huh? If it's Bob Dylan. Yeah, they, they, you know, because like sometimes they'll talk. You got a guy out there with a guitar and singing, like that. He's not causing noise. And nobody no. Hears it. That, that doesn't fall. As long as the neighbors don't grab That's what I. That's what I figured it might be. That's a tough Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So it's 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 getting late. So we have uh, two meaty topics, or maybe not. So one is discussion, and consideration, approval, and ordinance regulating food trucks. You're looking at me. 
the okay. the, uh, the okay. village attorney <laughs> the village attorney took uh, the information that the board had at the last meeting and shared regarding um, food truck. Uh, I would ask that the board approve this uh, ordinance with um, a couple of minutes to it. On page six, so, I'm sorry, uh, Ken pointed this out to me. On page six, uh, let the uh, of the ordinance. Oh, okay. number 19. And, and D, um, we're taking uh, midnight on Fridays and Saturdays to 11 o'clock. That was brought up at the last meeting to bring the hours down. I will point out that on page 7J, uh, we did end, we did put the um, compostable um, china and silverware in there. I did have a question on that. It still seemed pretty nebulous the way it was written. It said they'll make it a, you know, compostable available. It doesn't require them to. And I thought that was kind of a little nebulous wording. Making available and forcing people to use compostable utensils is a different thing. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how we would enforce it. Yeah, I think it's not use well, and what's the point? And don't, then don't put it in because they're more expensive, and people aren't going to use them. Like plastic cheapy, you know. What's the point? Well, I, I was I was thinking about a way that we could turn around and potentially reduce the permit cost in order to uh, uh, make an incentive for them to do it. To use compostable. Yeah. Yeah, I I think that's why because if if we over over regulate, they, they just won't come here. But but if we. And, and really like them. Yeah, but if we can turn around and give them an incentive to use it. Yeah. It's a hundred bucks though, right? It's not like it's a big incentive where you can give them a hundred bucks. What, what ten sandwiches? Okay, that's what that's good. I just thought it was the way it was written was just too soft. I thought, you know, making it available and requiring or I thought it was too soft But if you know, if we can request it and it happens. Well, of course, but otherwise it's I get it. Otherwise it's cheap plastic utensils. So you guys just for what? <laughs> and then if, okay, if, continue. If we can amend, if we can amend Q, uh, the attorney highlights uh, that the sponsoring venue may host more than two or three. Uh, may have more than two or three, but not more than six or eight set forth in a special event. So if the board could give us a number that they want there. What are, what are they going to like? Are they all going to be like covered wagons in a circle or are they? No, these are right now, these are just by sponsoring venues. So we don't know. It's, it could be one truck on. We, we haven't decided yet on location if we're going to do a tr uh, truck night. So can I make a suggestion? It should be less to start. I agree. More. So the smallest, two, two, six. if that's what the recommendation is. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Let's just see how this it's works. Easier, it's easier to go up than it is to come down. Yeah, right. Not in my house. <laughs> okay. I just think you should start small, but that's just me. So. Why would you limit it? I don't think we're getting Let's see if we get, let's see if we get people that, that want more. Let's see what happens. You know what I, mean? I don't know. It's your call. I mean, it's your, I don't get to vote. You all. No, I, I what do you mean you don't get to vote? You can vote. <laughs> you know, if there's three, there's circumstances. We may not get there. Okay. And, and then the last. Well, we might, just because you said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, three, four, one again, spend the time. Yeah, and, the, and the last piece for the amendment on this would be on page nine, letter. I would like a letter D inserted because I think Vic just forgot it was, or I missed it, that. Uh, a food truck operating under a licensed long grove food service business it does not get charged for the firm. Where, where, where is this? I'm sorry. It's not there. I'm asking that it be entered into D because it was something I brought up at the previous meeting that a food truck operating under a licensed long grove, long grove food service business they would not be they would not be charged for the permit. They're already paying for a business license. They're already paying sales tax. And somebody from the and and they're brick and mortar in town, so let's uh, let's give them a break. So help me understand. So if if eight food trucks show up and park in one parking lot and consume our parking lot, is that desirable? No. 
What it, okay, so is that well, I, I yeah, according to the ordinance as village manager, I can be, regulate that. Okay, okay, so you brought up another good point. <laughs> you guys are going to hate me. Um, some of the things in the in the in the ordinance, and I don't ask me where, but I remember reading them. Said things like the village manager can regulate them, or per the village manager's authorization. That scares me a lot. It's it's one person set of eyes subject to a lot of potential corruption, meaning, of course, that I would never suggest that of you. But having said that, if the barbecue grill, uh, the green big green egg shows up on my back porch, I'll let you do that. You know what I mean? It, it's really subject to a lot of corruption. I don't like the way that's worded in some of these documents. I really like it to be more firm. And I really like in the case where we do need that kind of Decision, it would be and flexibility. Two, set, two sets of eyes on it, you know, because I think you need more than one set of eyes to kind of, as Bill said, look the other way. Or so, we, would it be appropriate to just when we insert village manager, put village manager and village president? Or I think we minimize the that flexibility as much as we can, and then to me, I think we would. I mean, if there's you know, if run it past Bill if you need to, but I just don't like leaving that per all the socks. Uh, Sarbanes Oxley training and all the crap that we put into place, where you always have a couple sets of eyes looking at things. I, uh, you know, I will say it's not uncommon to be in various codes where the village manager has that latitude. But I'm somebody, I'm somebody who doesn't like getting yelled at that much. <laughs> no, I'm saying, right? Uh, just I don't know. I'll be. Quiet. If we get a message to the village, you know, village manager in consultation with the village president, and I see, you know, like the one may establish other conditions to be incorporated in a suit food truck operator. I see what you're referring to. We can make. I love it. Thank you. Okay. I love that because it's just safer, you know. So let's say. I got no problem with the checks and balance. Absolutely no, not. Okay. Thank you. I know that. So if we have six trucks that want to be here for the season, so to speak, whatever that is, is that truck parked at the same place each time? They have to have a sponsoring um, business. Ah. So if it's. So it's really one of the restaurants. Well, it, well, it could be Chatterbox. It could be. Okay. Uh, yeah. They could have a. I mean, they would solve the problem with the Tiki Bar having food. You know, so people. They were they were one of the they were one of the um, businesses that were excited about us yeah. moving forward with it. Yeah, that's a good idea. So let me ask this right now, because um, uh, it's. Five after nine. Um, do do we need more time with this, or, or is everyone comfortable? Well, go ahead. I would ask that the board. The reason I ask this is I would ask the board approve it with the amendments discussed. We'll get the new amendments incorporated from Bob and Vic. But the reason I ask it is we've got businesses already planning on food trucks, and if they if they want to use food trucks right now because we're post pandemic, they're operating outside the code. So I'd like to give them that protection and get this thing going if that's okay. okay. Yeah, no, does anyone uh, want to make a motion no. to approve no. as amended? So okay, move on. We decided on min or max, which? 226. 226. 226, okay, so moved by uh, Trustee Tanucci, seconded by Trustee no. O'Connor. Moved by Trustee O'Connor, seconded by Trustee Tanucci. Um, roll call, please. Trustee O'Connor. Aye. Trustee Tanucci. Aye. Trustee Brown. Aye. Ah, ha, ha. Sounds yummy, aye. All right, motion carried. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, so now um, there's um, a lot of discussion going on about um, potentially funding being stripped from us as part of the debt ceiling. So, so one of the things that we proposed was to use our COVID ARPA dollars to pay for police services. Um, that we've essentially already paid for, um, that, and then we'd have the ability then to take that funding. We would take the funding that we paid for the police and use that for the village hall, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this is just a protective, a protective yeah. thing for us to do. I don't know if there's any discussion or not. Have an issue with doing. It. You got that one. I, I need a shower after tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but I understand what we're trying to do. I understand we can't give that money back. So, um, Trustee Jamil, any thoughts, questions? Um, 
Are you okay with that? If, if you have somebody want to make a motion? So moved. Moved. <laughs> okay, so moved by Trustee Tanucci, seconded by Trustee O'Connor. Roll call, please. Trustee Tanucci. Aye. Trustee O'Connor? Aye. Trustee Barofsky? Aye. Trustee Jamil? Aye. All right, motion carried. All right, so now we have Village President and Trustee reports. Um, just it was a successful HOA meeting. Um, about 50 people approximately showed up for um, the discussion. The sheriff did a great job. Really great job. It was just a good dialogue about uh, safety and everything. Um, yes, yes. Uh, and I don't know what you meant by that, but anyways, I'll leave it there. Uh, so that's uh, the only other thing is I need to um, Sherry leaving. We no longer have a deputy clerk, so we need to uh, appoint Village Manager Jackson for the deputy clerk. Um, any objections to that? If not, I would look for a motion. I was going to object, but I'm okay. Michelle, you're not interested. She is the clerk. She can't be the deputy clerk. <laughs> so, does somebody want to make a motion? It's your turn. All right. I'd like to question. Um, no, I. <laughs> All right, so moved by Trustee Borowski, second by Trustee O'Connor. Roll call, please. Trustee Borowski. Aye. Trustee O'Connor. Aye. Trustee Jamil. Aye. Trustee Tanucci. Aye. All right, motion carried. So, Trustee Borowski, do you have a report? Uh, very briefly, the, the bill to implement statewide carpet recycling has failed to garner enough sponsors and has uh, reached its demise. So the, um, the carpet industry has been very aggressive in acquiring about 17 lobbyists who convinced enough people to drop their names off the sponsor list, and as a result, it is dead in the water right now. And yet those people will claim that they're in the environment. Well, gosh. The recycled carpet recyclers don't have enough money it's not a business model there for them to spend enough capital on the equipment needed to process the carpet. So without kind of a requirement for the carpet industry to subsidize it, there's not enough money there for the recycling shops. So there's no business base for it? No, right now there isn't. There's still a lot of discussion, um, but right now it's sort of in the water. Thank you for that report. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate. Trustee O'Connor. No. Uh, Trustee Tanucci. No report. Um, and I skipped. Uh, did you meal? Well, uh, you know, I was wondering, you know, the, it, I have some difficulty accessing the agenda item. Great. Uh, so I'll contact again both of you to see if I can figure out the Google Drive installation that I'm unable to access. I'm going through your link right now. That's one. Number two, um, is there any way in the agenda we can put up, uh, if we bring up some items raised by the residents, then we should be able to put that up in the agenda item. So do we get a, enough time for us to kind of say, hey, can we include this particular concern raised by particular? Yeah, that, that would come up in the trustees' report. So it, Trustees report. Yeah. So, so if you want to tell... Incorporate uh, letting the people know that uh, we raised those concerns, and then we incorporated that in the agenda, and we discussed that. Yeah, you, no, to do that. no, there is. You could, you're talking about it at the board meeting, right? Mm -hmm. On a trustees report, you would offer up something. For example, Trustee Tanucci wanted to do a community grant, uh, revamp the community grant program, brought it up, got input from the board, then it got moved to the agenda as an agenda item. So it would just come in as a trustees report. If residents have issues, I don't, I don't know kind of issues. They just call for the job. Yeah, if they've got something they need corrected, you know, if they say, you know, if we got a sign down or... Yeah, we get those calls every day. Right. So that's not a problem. Or they come before the board with public comment, too. Right. That's what the public comment's for, too. Yeah. But if it's a policy thing that you're interested in supporting and you want to bring forward the... Anything else? Uh, you know, to, to that point, if there's things that staff can do outside of this meeting, these guys have got great resources, very flexible, um, meet with residents, they'll do their diligence. It really helps a lot in terms of streamlining the meeting. Not that we ever want to discourage anybody from coming in and speaking their piece, of course, but, but these guys do a great job and can 
Yeah. I know. If it's something fairly routine that needs to be fixed, or a tree fell, or a sign is bent, or whatever, <laughs> those kind of things, <laughs> just call them. The center. president can call them in any time. Yeah. That's not something. Our defense is 1 800 call Greg. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, yeah, any report? Uh, anything from you? No, sir. Okay, so um, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Okay, moved by Trustee O'Connor, seconded by uh, uh, Trustee Jamil. All in favor, voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? Motion carries. Oh, it's great to do that. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>